Hey guys, my name is Jason with Mount Baker Mining and Metals, and this may be the biggest gold prospecting video series on all of YouTube. I've got Dan Hurd prospecting, I've got Ghost Town Living, Mine Operator, and a couple other special guests that are gonna show up. And we're gonna start right here in California with Mine Operator. We're gonna look for uranium today. We're gonna do some rare earth prospecting, so I'm excited to get after it. All right, let's hop in the side-by-side -side here. Mine operator is going to take me up to their uranium rare earth claims. We'll do a little prospect. Yeah, so this mountain here is all uh, quartz bonzonite. There's a lot of uh, quartz stringers, rhyolite, and andesite veins. And you kind of, it's kind of brecciated with a lot of quartz and, and andesite. And sometimes you get these gold, these gold quartz stringers in it. Oh, okay. So that's the gold stuff, not, not uranium. No. The uranium's back up over here on this mountain. That's Uranium Hill right there, and that's where the, the majority of the radioactivity is in the valley. Okay. So that's where you're focused on your uranium. That's right. Uranium Hill here, and on the back side, we have a bunch of pegmatite dike stringers that are running parallel, basically like east-west. And that's right behind it's, Uranium Hill. It's behind Uranium Hill up higher in the mountain, and you get these... Uh, Kind of like uh, chimneys of rare earths that squirted through with a lot of thorium, you know, and we're getting some decent radioactivity with the rare earths. Cool, and we'll hit those with the XRF. Today. Oh yeah, awesome! Yeah. Can't wait. I don't know if you can see the dump. There's a dump pile up there. There's a drift, a, a decline drift that goes into the mountain about two, three hundred feet. Okay. And it held values between one percent to one and a half percent. Wow. So they that that drift was purely for, for rare earths. We'll try to get into it today. Yeah, awesome. standing on the dump here there's the portal and what are we looking at here on the dump pegmatite so this is the stuff they were after yes sir so there's a couple pegmatite um, veins running perpendicular to this uh, drift that we're going to go in and that's what they were after and there's one in particular that they were trying to intercept all the way almost about to the end and it's underneath if you look up top you can see all the, the darker broken rock up there. There's okay. a pit where they're blasting trying to get to the highest uh, readings they got for thorium and that's where the rare earth is. So up top and down below they they correlate for what they they cross cut the vein with the drift. Okay. I guess it'd be an addit. So the addit. So they had um, drilled and blasted down and we don't know how deep it goes. We haven't it. But they were chasing this down and they intercepted it underneath about 150 feet beneath us. And um, you can see the two types of rock. So this would be a pegmatite and then now we start getting this this like uh, mica type material mixed with it. Um, kind of almost looks like it was all mixed together. Kind of like kind of like you were saying in the video, kind of like Venalis where it was just kind of mixed in the vein. Yeah, it looks like you've got a, a gabbro contact here, yeah. and then this pegmatite dike here, larger crystals, felsic, and then right here in this in this banded zone, in the contact zone, this is where the goodies are, huh? And it continues out, and then you kind of lose your rare earths once you start over. I mean, this is where the hottest rare earths are. On, I guess you call this the hanging wall at this point. Yep, hanging wall. Um, but this vein pretty much runs vertical along the whole strike um, with a few exceptions. So it runs hot here and then it kind of dwindles and I can go all the way out there and still get rare earths in the country rock. And there's a couple sister veins um, that are in close proximity, but it wouldn't be anything. Okay. Good. So we come up to the regular pegmatite, nothing. And then we get into The rare earth section and the stuff we're getting is primarily going to be thorium. So there's a lot of thorium in here. 
and I'm curious to see how much potassium is in this because we weren't able to measure it before. Mm, okay. So we're going to find out here shortly. It's right in that contact. Yep. So I'll put it in silent mode so you don't have to hear the incessant clicking. We're running about 3,000 counts per minute. And okay. So about 3,500. So when we see anything over a thousand, we get excited and then we break out the XRF and start sampling. So that's that's enough to get excited and... Yeah, it's enough for us to start taking samples with the XRF because then we can start building a, a map, a surface map of where we have the highest mineralization and then look at it from a bird's eye view and kind of see like where the concentrations are. Oh, I see. Um, so this helps us with the, the thorium, kind of helps us find the rare earths. You're going to want to start with like the country rock and then work your way across a vein structure with the XRF so you can kind of see where things change and what's going on with it. So the first beam is going to go for most of the base metals and lighter metals, but it's already picking up yttrium at 1200 parts per million. Everything's in parts per million in this particular scan, but once it goes over 10,000 parts per million, it goes into percent. Because... And a thousand parts per million is a uh, thousand grams a ton? Yes, that's right. Kil kilogram yeah. a ton. Yes, yeah, so we're picking up cerium, yttrium, latvium, thorium, and then everything else is just... And once you start getting into low numbers, like teens and twenties, it's crustal abundance. Yeah. But anytime you get into the hundreds and thousands... So we'll start from the top down. Um, it's just light elements. is LE. Silicone, iron, aluminum. There's our potassium at 4.5, so that's cool. There's magnesium, and then now what I'm really interested in is the rare earth. So we get the cerium, yttrium, latvium, neodymium. Mm -hmm. Neodymium's a big one for us. Um, and then thorium's down here. And then just all the other stuff that kind of squirted through it. So we're about 5,000 parts per million rare earths with what this can measure. This this machine can't measure all of them. You'd have to send it in for assay and to get all of them okay but this is getting the big ones and so at that yeah, you said 5,000 yeah around 5, so you've got 000. about 10 pounds a ton yeah so the numbers I got there if I saw that I'd want to send that in for assay so okay I think I'll drill and get the drill dust out of that and then bag it and then XRF it in the bag and then send it off for assay and see see how close they are okay and then that way on future projects with this model we'll know this is the one we want to use when did they do this work this was early 1950s and so they were looking for rare earths even in the 50s oh, uh, yeah. well early uranium yeah uranium and so everybody was yeah. out here combing the hills with geiger count oh, okay so they they thought this thou crop here had enough uranium to go after they didn't care about the strontium and the thorium and the right. neodymium and stuff but that's yeah. that stuff was showing up in the assay i see and so that's where your guys are getting excited is over the rare earths in this thing and, and they were walked over in the past yeah you know a lot of prospectors at that time didn't know what the values were to those yeah well and there probably wasn't any value in the 50s right i mean that, who cares yeah not much we got some drill cuttings that harry just did that is uh that's some pretty fine material right there so if you didn't want to mill that down a great way to do it is to put a drill bit in there and look at the size you get that's ready for chemical assay so you're going to send you're going to send that in for assay but you're going to shoot it with the xrf first, first. Yeah. Yeah. and compare yeah. awesome yeah. so what's your total uh rare earth parts per million Ten thousand. yeah ten thousand. so about ten thousand yeah. parts per million rare earths. a percent a percent somewhere around a percent just off what this thing can see so with the other ones it doesn't pick up we might run about 1.2 1.3 percent okay just from past stuff we've done so this is, this is a pretty good shot right there and it matches up pretty much with your assays you've done before you said anywhere from a half to one and a half percent yeah, and this is pegged at one yeah. percent oh yeah a lot of rare earth deposits may not be viable unless it's three or five percent grade but that's usually lighter elements like cerium and lanthanum, and they have very little quantities of praseodymium, dysprosium, or even uh, neodymium. Here we have a smaller percentage, like 1%, but we have higher concentrations of neodymium, praseodymium, and dysprosium. So it might be viable for us to go after, and that's why we're out here prospecting.
Yeah, those heavier elements make the difference. Absolutely. So we're gathering up <clears throat> samples out of the uh, tailing pile here from this prospect hole, and we're shooting it with the XRF. Different different ones have different amounts of the uh, rare earth in them, and we're trying to determine by visual uh, <clears throat> once we put it under the gun, and we can see which ones we can pick up out here without having to waste our time with low value samples. And so you're finding the ones that are shinier, for lack of a better term, the uh, yellower, more oxidized. Not shinier so much as uh, yeah, more of a gold, more golden. Like maybe because there's more iron in it, it's more a little rustier looking. Okay, those are the good ones. Seems to be so far. If you want to buy a piece of this, check out Mine Operator's eBay page. So this is one of the ones um, I to ask him about we scan that. and we're getting cerium and yttrium. Egg. Close to eight nine hundred, and then um, was... we get some lanthanum, neodymium, four five hundred, and then just a crustal abundance after that. And that's just the stuff you're finding on the surface. Oh yeah, yeah, from what they blasted. We're going in, going in, cross cut the vein here, and we'll look at the uh, Geiger counter. An XRF underground. You can tell a lot of water. Oh, wow, yeah. In that last big curve. What's that sound? I think that. I think my GPS is still on. <laughs> yep. Telling me to turn right in 1.8 miles. <laughs> <laughs> At least you know where you're going. So, Jason, the first time we came into this, we, we didn't know what was out here, and we were chasing gold and silver, so we thought they were chasing this little stringer vein up top, thinking it was like maybe some kind of a silver or gold, not realizing, you know, there's rare earths in it. Uh-huh, and they intersected back here a couple hundred feet. So it took us, what, two years to figure that out? And you know, keep in mind, this was all done by one person by hand. This entire crosscut. What? Yeah. This is fire in the hole. Fire yeah. in the hole guy. Yeah, he, he's, he's uh, fondly referred to by uh, the older gentleman who used to own this as fire in the hole. Because he'd load his round, he'd run outside and yell, fire in the hole! And it would echo down through the canyons and then the blast. <laughs> they never met him. They no. only heard him cry out from the distance. Fire in the hole! He did this by hand? Yeah. Well, he drilled and blasted, but, uh, but just one man. Himself. I see. You know wow. how he got the material out of his mine? A wheelbarrow. Uphill. Uphill. I don't know why he was drifting downward. Yeah, that makes no it, sense. that makes it real hard. As you can see on the floor here, the water has been running. Yeah, it just makes a pond down here at the bottom when it's wet. Yeah. Wait, hold on. I don't feel right. Wait, wait. And now I feel better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, this bend is... over. Hey, Jason, <laughs> you see how the back is high and it can stand up straight? Yeah. Maybe, can we do that next year? <laughs> I don't know. This, this, this is pretty weird. <laughs> I don't know if we could all deal with standing up straight. Standing up. Well, oh, he was really ramping down. Oh, what's that? He was really ramping down. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure why. So look over your head. You've got the rare earth thing. Oh yeah, it's all this. But here it looks like it crisscrosses the other direction too. This is different. This has got a lot of copper in it, and I think it's just leached from the surface, pulling you know the material through. So I'm curious what the new X rep says about this because there's copper in there. And we did get a couple hits for gold with the old XRF. Um, but this is that, that pit up top we were standing in. Uh -huh. We're pretty much in the same, we believe it's the same vein. We're underneath it. So we think that that pit and this at it were both designed to figure out what's going on with this stuff. Mm -hmm. I believe we did the right angle calculation before. Yeah. And it does make sense it does. that we're at the spot. And it, it pretty much starts here. I believe we measured 12 foot across. And you gotta remember it's not running this way, but it's running that way. Oh, I see. Slightly radioactive. 
about over here on this side. You know, we're starting to get close to a thousand. It usually runs about, the uh, radioactivity usually runs about 800 to a thousand counts per minute here, down in here, which is surprising because up top it was like over 3,000. Yeah. Um, so Jason, this is where Ron and I had prospected um, in here. So we kind of took the extra half and went across yeah. the width of this peg. It's actually pretty wide. Yeah. Um, and we used the extra up to kind of find the hottest spots. And we, we drilled some of the holes here. And, and this is where we sent an assay from it. Yeah, so this is where we got, so the Geiger picked up the hottest. And then that's where we put the extra up on it. So what numbers do you have there? I'm about, I lied to you, it's over a thousand now. We're about just tapping 1,400 counts per minute. Okay. So. This is a lot of work for 1,400 counts per minute. Yeah. Well, they're gonna let me use this really expensive XRF here. We're gonna scan the wall, what, somewhere in here, Harry, yeah, I think? Pick a spot. And All right. Get comfortable. Pull the trigger. Pull the trigger. Oh boy, we got some good stuff in here. I don't know. Can I? Can I? Yeah, you can. You can scroll I can, up and I can down move, during, move during while the play. it's while it's doing its thing. Oh, yeah. I, I don't even know what all the good stuff is in here. Let's see. You guys are way past me. Oh, yeah. So yttrium three. six six forty ish, cerium five, neodymium four hundred, lanthanum. I call it latvium, but it's lanthanum. Lanthanum. So there's some stuff in here. Yeah. Not great. Not right. like what we saw upstairs in the pit. The radiation drips on you. It really falls down on you. <laughs> Jason's gonna take this thing from us. I can tell. I like. We're gonna check. We're gonna check his car before he leaves and make sure it doesn't <laughs> go with him. This is good. You guys can just get another one, right? Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're cheap enough. Yeah. Find a Home Depot. You sell, grab you one. sell both your kids. Yeah, right. <laughs> you might be able to get one. Yeah. So how long? Uh, Harry, do you have to press and hold the trigger, or you just you just the squeeze gun? the trigger? It's fire and forget, and it runs in this particular mode in geochem um, for the rare earth. It's set up for three beams. So Olympus gave us three beams. Um, the first and the last will pick up the rare earth. You got some gold in here. We're not after gold. Okay, throw what's that it say? out. Throw it back. What's it say? What's five, the number? Five parts per million. And what's the number on the right? Five. Yeah, so it's not true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's the error on the right. Error. Yeah. Plus or minus five. But you know, there's gold randomly in the rocks. I mean, you got some tellurium again. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was a bust. All now, right. try to check this. Check this nice meaty yellow stuff. Nice orangey red. I might have to change the mode after you scan it to go get all the precious metals. This one here. Yeah, but I'm curious what that is. Right been, there. Yep. I've been dying to know what this is. All right. This thing's heavy. Oh yeah, now I'll get to hold <laughs> yeah, it for a minute. There's, yeah. there's the copper I was talking oh, about. Oh yeah, 2400. Yeah, not mineable, but... Okay, pretend you're having fun. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> it's all quiet. <laughs> I'm doing an isometric hold for a minute and a half. <laughs> I'm kidding. He's this got the smile. Quiet either. He's got the smile down. S is sulfur, correct? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, so I always thought this yellow stuff was sulfur. When we first came here, we thought it was uranium. We got all excited and then found out with the delta it was not. But we couldn't see sulfur. So, yeah, that's sulfur, copper. So it is, in fact, sulfur. Cerium. And then gold and silver showed up. So I'd probably throw the gold and silver out, but because those base metals are in there with sulfur, there's a chance that it's, it's somewhere somewhere in the rock. So it sounds like it just pulled out of the rock and put it in here and it's mm. low grade. Don't waste your time. We're here at the portal here at our uranium mine and we've got uraninite and autunite as the two most common uranium minerals here. Uraninite being the primary mineral and autunite being the secondary mineral that was leached from uraninite. So come on in, take a look. Yeah, we got the sun in just the right direction here, huh? Yeah, it's about to set. Now you can see, before we put on our ultraviolet lights, what it looks like before it fluoresces. You can see how it's leached all around the rock. And this is what fluoresces. This is the autunite mineral. And it's all this, wh this white stuff here. Not, I don't know white, but... Kind like, of like a dull yellow. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all that kind of crusty looking stuff in the cracks. Yep.
That's it. So that's going to fluoresce and look amazing when it gets dark. And as you look around, you'll see some darker minerals too. That's what I'm suspecting is the uraninite as, as a cubic crystal, but they're small. That little microscope on my phone can't zoom in enough to see if they're cubic or spherical. So I, I'm a little unsure on that one. It is all throughout here. This area has been heavily drilled and there's an area here that is like one to 10% uh, uranium. Wow. So that's pretty high grade. We hope to find it, um, but haven't yet. In the, in the drill holes, in the old drill holes? Yeah, 80 feet to 100 feet down. It's a, how much did you say? One to 10%? Yeah. <sighs> it's super high grade. Yeah. That's a Canada status right there. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Baskin Basin, Baskin Basin. So, but yeah, it's not that long of a working in here, but they were using this as one of their prospect addits to explore the mineralization and you can see how it's, well, at night when it fluoresces, it's a lot easier to see how it's just leached into all of the joints and cracks, so just magnificent. Right now it's a little boring. Well, we'll let sunset and then we'll get a uh, black light in here. Well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll grab some samples, whether they're already been, you know, chipped off, demoed out, or right on the ground, and we're gonna sell them on our page. Nice. On our eBay page. So cool. If there's any collectors out there looking for uranium minerals, we got some to sell. Nice. Check out my operator's eBay page. I don't know. We're like 12, 13,000. Oh, multiply, okay. multiply that by 10. By 10. Okay. So 1,000 by 10. Still pretty good. That one's a little drummy. You your scale some of this down. <laughs> so I grabbed some samples in here already. Um, Harry, you want to... Yeah, hit any of these and see if you got some yeah. decent. Yeah, this one's louder. As soon as you get any of the ot night on there. Yeah. So that looks like a good one. Chad's hand. All yellowy, cakey looking stuff. Yep. Okay. That one is 20,000. You're still on the multiply by 10? Yeah, I'm in 10 now. There's so that's 25. 25. Ooh, find more of that. Okay. Now we found where it's hot with the Geiger counter. Now we can check with the XRF. Uh, let's take an assay right here. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Really, it just shows up right on the, yeah. That's pretty impressive. Definitely a hot zone. Yeah. Well, you're gold. I know. I. I don't know how what do to say have, there. How do you have 500 parts per million gold? So wherever the uranium is super high here, we get crazy numbers on our gold, and we don't know why. If anybody there in watching this video knows the answer to that, please let us know, because we get some really odd gold readings. And look at palladium showing up astronomical. 97, 9,000. So we can't believe that. That's just doesn't seem real. All right, so we've got 2.367% on uranium, which is awesome. And I don't believe that number. Eight, almost 9,000 parts per million palladium. There's got to be some effect from the uranium uh -huh. on the radioactivity of the elements used in the XRF. I, Makes it think it's a different element because, yeah, that'd be like the richest palladium ore in the world. Right. And we're getting gold that high, too. Yeah. You might as well move down from Washington, Jason, and start <laughs> mining with us here. Set up a plant. Yeah. So not that high on anything else. No. But, but to be at 2% uranium, that is a number we can confirm mm -hmm. with chemical assays. We could believe that number. Okay. Got a spot you like? Yeah, yellow. Oh, that's all yellow, yeah. All right. All right. So let's... All right, what'd you get there? All right, Jason. So we got just under 1.5% on uranium mm -hmm. right there where it's leaching. So that's a good sign. Now, I'm curious, though, what the grade would be if we were to crush it down all together and see what a homogeneous uh, sample would look like. Rather than just on the joint face where it's all leached on it. Yeah. Yeah. So... Does it drop to half a percent or less? 
we'll find out. So we got a 2.3% spot, Harry, and uh, and Jason, we got a 1.5% spot, so. Oh yeah, look at that. Oh yeah, you see it. Kill your light, see, I'm not sure if the GoPro will pick that up. Yes. Nice. Nice. All right, we got 8,000 uranium, 2,000 palladium. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> What's the gold? 252 gold. Oh, yeah. Well, we, we've got it made now, huh? You got everything in there. Except there's like no silver, right? No silver. No, it's too bad. No copper. It's pretty, pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. This thing's so cool. <laughs> so cool. So everything glowing green is uranium. Mm hmm. There was a really cool spot back there about halfway, wasn't there? Oh, yeah. Let's go check that spot out. I'll zap it with the gun. It seems like the first 10 seconds with this thing yeah. gets it pretty pretty good. True, close enough to where you don't have to go the hole. Yeah, right. I mean, we can go the 10, 20 seconds and... <laughs> I'm down. Yeah, that's good. Look at that stuff. Here, let me get the gun in there. Yeah, watch out for the pokies, but no. I got extra cellophanes in case you pop. No pokies, okay. Pick, pick a good spot for me. Where do you want to go? Anywhere. <laughs> Anywhere, yeah. Probably like right there. Yeah, so right there is 2200 uranium. Quite a bit of lead. PB. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. That right there, I've been told that will determine the age of the mineralization. Oh, yeah, because of the half life. Yeah, and oh. the decay. So that's an interesting test right there. We got a lot of lead Check on this out. test. We do a hot swap on the battery. Oh, boy. Whoa. It'll stay live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's like a capacitor in there or something that keeps it going for... Let's see. Nice. Back in business. Wow, cool. You didn't even shut it off. No. Saves time, right? Yeah. When you're out in the field and you got to get sampling done. Yeah. That's, that's good. Yeah, 3,500 uranium. Uh, 193 gold. <laughs> no lead. None. Have you gone through all the way to the, the third beam? Did you see any change in uranium values by the third beam at all? No. no Chad and I did a couple for the yeah. full 70 seconds. And yeah. it, I mean, it, narrow, it like narrowed it down a little bit, but yeah. like less than 5%. Nice. Right. Like hardly any. That's nice. You just abort the test and get your number and keep moving. Yeah. Don't spend a minute and a half of your life waiting. Yeah. That's rad. So this is like the hottest rock you have out here, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I think this has the highest ratings, Jason. It goes crazy on the Geiger <laughs> counter. Let's see what we get with the XRF on this. Two more seconds. All right, test is done. 18% uranium right on that yellow mineral. And <laughs> Man, look at how yellow it is, too. That is absolutely insane. Look at the, the readings here. And I'm just going to scroll through. Let's see if we got anything else worth noting. Yeah, yeah, look at the gold. 1,970. Wow. So yeah, we gotta send that in for assay to see if we have any kind of confirmation on that. Cadmium, tellurium low. All right. So we're gonna go up to some of these prospect pits here behind Harry. There's some other ones around. We'll, we'll do all kinds of stuff today and get this XRF working for us and see if we can find any gold and silver. The mountain right here behind us is a felsic intrusive. So felsic means more quartz and less iron. And intrusive means that it was cooled under the surface. So it's not like a lava that came out on the surface, it cooled underneath. This has been called a quartz monzonite. That's what mine operator's been calling it from the old reports. So it's this really felsic intrusive. And then the stuff right here behind me, like a rhyolite. So that's a more volcanic type of deposit that actually came to the surface and exploded out of a volcano. We're walking up to the prospect pit now. This is a little wall somebody made, and it's very, very felsic, very light colored, lots of quartz. There is some iron staining in here. Looks like maybe some decomposed sulfides, but this is looking like a fairly fine grained rhyolite, very, very weathered. But we're gonna look for some vein structures here, and we'll get Harry going with the, with the uh, XRF. Looks like somebody's been poking around here a little bit. Some more 
iron staining red here maybe a little quartz vein structure they were working down this way see some drill holes looks like somebody's been sampling and then they traced the vein here over to this little prospect pit what are you finding here harry uh getting a little bit of silver but nothing okay. nothing i haven't really seen before this thing is so cool not a whole lot of anything exciting in that one no what are you focusing on here what are the gold is the, the primary target just because this particular mountain here has gold bearing veins and silver going uh silver bearing veins okay and uh there's a lot of these little old prospects out here from the old timers and then some guys in the more of a modern times that kind of prospected it but they usually miss you know they, they start out on the vein if it doesn't really open up they they bail yeah this one the old timers kind of prospected up on this spot and a couple other and they just went right into this and they didn't really see anything but they kind of missed it because if you go down um in this spot you end up picking up um one quartz vein that kind of comes through what i think is rhyolite or some type of andesite okay and the veins kind of come up together like this so um my buddy found a stringer of quartz right in here real thin all broken up in the rhyolite and it's bit bare bears gold okay so um they've been chasing it through here and they found another kind of intersection of material that kind of kind of came through right here and so um, we got some decent colors in here, you know, the colors the old timers like to see. A lot of reds, uh, kind of like this, some limonite. So this stuff uh, out here, when you find limonite, you generally find gold. Okay. So we've been chasing this and we think if we get down below the oxides, we might be able to find, find, find the gold. Okay. And so let's take a look at the structures here. What are we... What are we looking at in this pit? Is this this red from here to here? Is that the vein? Pretty much the, the full width of the vein is, is to your back. And then you can see the altered the altered country rock over here. Okay. Um, the vein's running more or less right through here and then right up right in front of you. So kind of there's one wall yeah. here and then all the way over to here somewhere. That's right. But yeah, I see the quartz here now. Yeah. Is the is the red a good indicator? Or do we know? Looks uh, like I got some manganese staining. Iron, but usually when I start seeing iron staining, um, then usually we start chasing into the quartz, and then when you start seeing a lot of other different colors and maybe even a little bit of copper, we start getting excited. Okay. It is so different prospecting here in the Southwest than it is back home in Washington State. The rocks here are so old; they've been sitting on the surface for long long time hundreds of thousands or millions of years they're weathered they're all oxidized whereas back home in washington one everything's covered in trees and dirt so it's hard to see anything but it was glaciated only about ten thousand years ago so the whole rock surface of northern washington state was pretty much wiped clean and all the surface exposure is pretty fresh compared to the stuff down here so i got to get my my different eyeballs on so i can identify some of the different structures and you're looking at it through the lens of it's been weathered, it's hard to see, there's rust everywhere. And so it's just a, a whole different ball game down here when you're prospecting in the Southwest. But that tool is so cool because I got a rock that, you know, looked kind of good. And rather than send it in for an assay, waiting three weeks or a month and paying 80 bucks, boom, in 20 seconds, we know what's in it. All right, so this is one of the spots we prospected in the past. Uh -huh. um, and as you can see, there's a lot of hanging rock there on the hanging wall that's pretty dangerous. So we kind of gave up on this spot. But the vein comes through at about 75 degree dip. Um, and there's a, a quartz vein that runs along it and there's alterations on either side, but on the foot wall in this dark um, decomposed iron, kind of like limonite, we call it chocolate out here. Okay. We didn't know what it was at the time, so we call it chocolate. That's where the gold is, and I've drill tested through the vein, um, through the vein in the hang wall, through the vein in the foot wall, in the quartz, and it's primarily in that little band on the foot wall. Oh, but it's really rich. Oh yeah. Yeah. Really rich, gold and silver. So it's been picked on pretty good. Let's see if I can pick up, pick up any gold out of it. It's not visible in the vein, but once you run it, you know, crush it in a mill and run it through a sluice. It's pretty, pretty awesome. It's an interesting uh, country rock change here. Yeah. This looks more like a, more of a mafic, like a gabbro. 
So a different host than the rhyolite we saw on the other side, but very clear vein structure. Nice looking, nice looking structure. Oh yeah, it's been, when we first started, it was like to here. And then uh, every once in a while we get bold and pick on it a little more and a little more. <laughs> and you're like, well, you know, it's kind of, the angle's wrong. So getting a little dodgy. I think if we ever came back to it, we'd, we'd start from the top down mm. and then get in on it and then, then drift in on it. The guy that originally did this, he'd made it wide enough so he could get his little small Jeep into here. Oh, he drove down he in there. He was drilling and blasting, and then he was low, he was pulling out the, the, the waste rock and the ore with a cart on the back, you know, hitched up to his Jeep, and he was driving his Jeep out of this thing. Whoa, cool. So he, that was his style. One thing about prospecting with the XRF is you are only scanning like a square centimeter or less of area of the vein. So you can get some really, really high gold results, really high silver results that are not indicative of the grade of the entire vein. So that's one thing where if you're prospecting with one or if you're talking to somebody who has prospected with one and is talking about these outrageous XRF results they're getting, like percentages of gold, you got to take that with a grain of salt because that's not indicative of the mineable width in any way. So just be careful when you're talking about XRF readings or when you're prospecting, just because you find this really super hot reading doesn't mean that it's necessarily an ore body. Man, it's funny with gold, right? It's not disseminated perfectly through the vein in this case. So if you don't have it like right on it, you're going to completely miss. Right. Okay, I'll let you go first. If you see rat droppings, that means they're snakes. Okay. <laughs> One more thing we don't have to worry about in the Northwest. Snakes. See if it's still so he was driving his Jeep down here, huh? Yeah. Here's our little trace of the vein right here. Now we followed the vein down, uh, it's now buried, but we followed it down to this edge here on the hanging wall and uh, it turned green. It oh, turned really? Green. Yeah, there's nothing in it though. Boy, we're down to just a little trace now. It's the amount of vein starts to whiten out right here. Okay. And I suspect that this decomposed iron is where the gold is running in this vein. But we only did a channel sample in here. Yeah, this is kind of like a faulted zone, huh? Mm -hmm. And I believe we took the channel sample across the full width. You were saying the gold's in this we believe it's in the limonite or the, the iron stained portion this, of the vein. This red stuff yeah. here, huh? Yeah, like this is the stuff it looks like in your mine where you're getting mm -hmm. that super high grade stuff. And it's cool because sometimes in, in the quartz vein you can see the opposing um, matrix of the quartz crystals. And you'll see sometimes, like you can cut, you kind of see here, you got actual uh, quartz crystal terminations. Oh, yeah, where they kind of like grew together. Yeah towards each other yeah so i've always kind of we, we see a lot of this type of rock in the in the waste dump and it's all manganese stained uh quartz crystals but they're all terminated and then the the, the vein is actually pretty well defined on the face so this one comes down and yeah, there's definitely like a fractured yeah. zone. Yeah. But it looks like the vein here is only about eight or ten inches wide. But this would be this would be the part that I'd be interested in. That's the chocula stuff. You're yeah, the chocolate stuff. <laughs> yeah. Cleverly coined. So it's 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 actually out here outside the vein structure. I mean this this is the vein main vein structure with the right. quartz. And you're you're talking about over here is the good stuff. Yeah. Uh, but it switches sides, you know, it, it can be on the foot wall or the hanging wall. It, I haven't seen it here, but in other mines we've seen it where it'll be on the foot wall and then it'll do the vein travel and end up on the hanging wall. Okay. Looks like this might be the vein. The vein came up, baked the wall rock, because this is the gabbro. This is the host rock. 
probably all the way to here and it just got baked when it came in hot. Same here, a baking zone and then you're out into the gabbro. A little slip there maybe. Well, I'm just going to wing out how I would prospect with this thing. Again, I mentioned earlier, you're not looking for like the highest gold grade you can get, the highest silver grade you can get. What this machine is really, really good at is giving you abundances of indicator minerals. And so we've identified just looking here at the structure. This is uh, the country rock here. We've got a baking zone. You got the vein here, another baking zone, and then back into the country rock. It appears that the country rock is the same on both sides. But what I'm going to use this for is I'm going to come way over here into the country rock. I'm going to start zapping along, getting an idea of what's in the country rock. I'm going to get into the baking zone. I'm going to do the same thing, take a couple shots there, see if there's any mineralogical change there or elemental change. I'm going to check out the vein itself and then back through to the other side. What I'm looking for is base metals, lead, copper, uh, and then obviously silver and gold abundances. But uh, again, that's not, I'm not trying to get like a super high reading here. I'm just trying to identify where the value may be. And then I can come back with a channel sample and an assay and figure out exactly where the values are bound in the system. Because it may be there's enough values in this baking area that we want to take it. But again, you're going to need an assay to figure that out. So I'm just going to start here. Pick a fairly fresh face. I'm not an XRF expert, but what I think I know is the longer you hold it down, the more accurate you get. We'll do about 15 seconds per spot. And so this is a bunch of light elements, a little bit of iron, a little bit of titanium, a little bit of manganese. There's some zinc, a little bit of copper, a little bit of lead, 66 and 23. So we're going to come across here. Here's another nice looking fresh surface. Now the hope is once we get over into the baking area, we might see the mineralogy change a little bit. So we'd be looking for increased base metals. So we've still got our iron and titanium. The manganese has gone away, which is an interesting thing to note. So we don't have as much manganese going on. The zinc has dropped off as well. There's still some. Copper, 75 or so, lead, 54. There's some tungsten that shows up, which is new. A little bit of bismuth, arsenic. And again, this is in the baking zone. So we're gonna continue across. I'm gonna shoot a spot that's a little closer to the vein. Our iron and titanium levels have gone down. Still showing up, but not nearly as much as what was in the country rock. Still got some zinc, a little bit of nickel, our coppers, 45, a little bit of arsenic, not much. So we're not seeing a whole lot of mineralogical change even into the baking zone. So now we'll hit the or the, uh, the vein system here, a couple different spots. Now we don't have, there's a little bit of titanium showing up, but our iron, titanium, and manganese levels are way low. We have copper again. The thing we found so far is that the Iron, manganese, and titanium levels were really high once we were back in the country rock. And as we get closer to the vein and in the vein system, those drop way off. Now they're a little bit higher in this area. The lead is high. The copper is higher, 75. And again, I'm not concerned about how much copper there is. I'm not trying to find mineable grade copper. But it's interesting to note that the copper elements or the copper abundance has gone up. The lead is very high here, about 700. Arsenic is high as well, about 100. Copper still low. So we're getting some elevated lead levels in the vein. It's interesting to note. And then we'll just work our way. I'll take a couple shots across and see if we get back. My hypothesis is once we get back into the unbaked stuff, we're going to have a lot more iron, manganese, and titanium. So this gives you kind of an idea of the broad scale of what you're looking for. And so what I learned from this real quick test is the country rock away from the vein has a bunch of iron, titanium, and manganese in it. Once you get into the baked zone or even into the vein structure, the manganese and the titanium especially drop way off to nothing. So if you're up on the surface or if you're prospecting around and you start to see those titanium 
and manganese and, and iron levels drop off, it may be an indication that you're getting close to a vein system. You might be in the baking zone um, and it gives you an idea of what to look for. Here's our next zone. What do you call this, Harry? We call this the bat cave. The bat cave. And this is the same style working as the last one we were in. And he also used his Jeep to get material out and in. But this one's a little different. He uses railroad ties for all of his timbering. Okay. And the, the back is really high. So what's, I, I'm seeing a structure here, but I'm not seeing any obvious veins. He chased this down deep and he got underneath a portion of the vein and stoked up. And really? I think this is where the guy hit the jackpot. There's, this is boring. fairly boring and unremarkable looking to me. Yeah. All right, well, let's go in. Don't get bit by a bat. Let's see if we can find some. Oh, he had a Good wildlife. Stuff. Whoa! Sleeping wildlife. Is he asleep or dead? Oh, I think he shed. Is he dead? No, he's still still intact. Ooh. That's a tarantula. <laughs> Why are you picking that up? Well, because they shed their exoskeleton like crabs do. So sometimes Okay. That's the exoskeleton, but in this case, I think he's just dead. Uh-huh. Well, this really is just unremarkable. Yeah. This is all this I, and and for those of you watching, this is an unbelievable amount of work to do this. Like he, whoever this guy was, really, really, really wanted to do this and spent a bunch of money doing it. But I don't know what his indicator was. I mean, he must have saw something on the surface that he was trying to get under. Or... Are you talk about jimbo mining. Come take a look at this timber work. <laughs> Looks like something we'd do. Yeah. Creosoted railroad Looks ties. Like he's using a drill steel for some kind of a pulley mm. um, point. But yeah, there's a lot of railroad ties. Boy, that's quite the tinker toy setup he did there. I like his. Uh, I like his block right there. <laughs> like his engineering is stellar. I like how he he just crisscrossed them all and tried to support them in the middle, but then there's nothing holding up the middle underneath it i mean at least, at least he you know for the for the post and cap at least he put something in there to keep it from coming in but yeah but look really, at <laughs> there's really nothing to keep it from you know falling like a house of cards well he put it he put his his i don't know space or whatever you want to call it in yeah. but then it's broken in the middle there's nothing it's just nails that's holding that thing out you, you want that thing to go all the way across all the way as one unit yeah Huh. Emsha nightmare in here. So now you start to get color. And this is what he was after. Um, we've taken some chip samples from here and didn't get anything. Oh boy, he was working up here, huh? Oh yeah, this is where he worked up. Jeez. And he had a pocket up here, we think. Now in this type of mineralization, um, it's the quartz is mostly barren. But if you start picking up silver sulfides, uh, it's called argentite out here, it'll be around a gold pocket and they'll be somewhere on one to two ounce per ton pockets and they're not very big. Okay. He found a couple out here, we know he did. Okay. Um, it's in the report. So, so if you get in here, it's gonna be hard for you to see. But he went up here. There's the vein structure. Oh. We think his pocket was up in here. Okay. So this is what he was after. Wow. So you're looking straight up now. Yeah, straight up. Oh boy, he's got, what the heck has he got going on up there? Now, yeah, he, he went all the way to the surface and used 55 gallon drums to run his ventilation to keep going. <laughs> so so he, those are his vent, vent yeah, bag, essentially. Yeah, that was basically his ventilation. Then he ended up running his air and water down here. So he was, he was jack legging too. Wow. But he was going down. I mean, trying to jack leg down is a nightmare, right? Did he did he go down or did he get here and go up? Well, that's pretty creative about making a tube out of barrels, though. Oh, it gets better. Okay. Well, there's more, huh? So the vein runs along the right-hand side. You know, I guess that would be the, the foot wall, the right side. And uh, there's really nothing going on here. He just made this super wide. He's got to get his Jeep down here, I guess. Now, he has a shaft that's behind this on the exact same vein. They went down about 200, 250. 
Jeez, and he really? had multiple drifts in there, and he was chasing the silver. And in the silver pockets, you found gold too. Okay. So this wasn't like a super continuous vein like mine. This or, vein, I, I mean, the actually, structure's here. Believe it or not, the vein structure that we're standing on, it runs probably about 500 feet. And you can you can pick it up on the surface. I'll show you outside. Okay. And it, the, the quartz gets huge. Really? Yeah. A couple feet wide. But it's, but it's super spotty. It's super spotty, yeah. Not what you want in a mine, right? No. So this is his next creation. Wow, look at that thing. So it must have been part of a grain silo that he drug in here and then did his best to weld on site. What was he trying to... There was something there he didn't like in the back. Boy, it's old rail... Or no, it's just I-beam. Yeah. And he just welded up a... He's very huh. creative. That's... That's something. Go miners. Yeah. <laughs> and then he gets down further and then the rock changes. This is the same guy that was mining that yep. last mine we were at? Yep. Okay. Have you yeah. met him or has he died? No, no, he's, he's long gone. Oh, okay. Um, the gentleman that we uh, partnered with on this other property, he, they knew of him. Um, this wasn't fire him. in the hole, man, was it? No, no, it wasn't fire in the hole. Okay. No one's ever met that guy. Okay. That's kind of interesting. Holy cow, water! Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. <laughs> sorry. I, didn't, I just, I just I don't expect, know what's about to happen. I don't expect water in the desert. Yeah. So, I figure the reason why there's water here is because this is the end of it, or this is the water table. Yeah. Because there's a couple places out in the area where you can find the water at about 60 feet. Mm, okay. So the water table, we think, is shallow out here. Yeah. Well, there's a nice little quartz vein right there yep. in the wall, but I don't see it well, really overhead. I see an iron sulfide. Do you? I, it's, just, it's just bonkers to me that he did all this work and I just don't really see much of a structure or uh, anything to get really excited about. The vein looks pretty good. It's only about two inches wide, but... Yeah, so out here you get these cubic iron pyrites in the quartz. And sometimes you get close to the gold. In this case, we're picking up gold, uh, about 29 parts uh, with about 11 parts error. So that's, what, about half an ounce a ton, right? Yeah. And then there's silver running about 140. And that's in that little quartz stringer right there. Yeah, so you can see the... This dark staining iron. Oh yeah. So that's the good stuff, huh? For him it was, and that pocket is covered in those up top, the little stope that you were just looking in. Uh-huh. It's full of that. I kinda wanna get up in there. <laughs> <laughs> Harry's shaking his head. Man, that is a huge beam he put across there. That must be like a 16 by 16 or something crazy like that. And he doesn't have it hitched in very well. He's got the, that side over there is against some wood. So you wouldn't like to see that. And then this side over here has got some blocks shoved in there. Yikes. Some big lagging on top. Not a place I'd want to work. Using your I-beam for a hitch. <laughs> <laughs> Right in the middle of the span, there's another one. Definitely some interesting support and timber work in here. And you were saying we're driving, all this darker stuff is Gabbro, we're driving on this dark gray. That's what I'm told, but I'm not a geologist. Yeah, no, it looks like Gabbro from here. And we get, we get pegmatite and, and quartz montanite float out here. The lighter stuff, the darker stuff's the gabbro, more mafic. And the, the, the quartz has the uranium. That's right. So this will be the quartz montanite and pegmatite. This is one of the dikes that is kind of fishing through. Uh-huh. You can see the contact zone here. Yeah, that's a great shot. There's the... Gabbro on the right, it looks like. 
and the lighter felsic stuff in the left. Quartz monzonite? Did I get that right? As long as that's what we sound confident, yeah, it'll probably yeah. be fine. But this is one of the cool things about the hills, the view you get. Yeah, it's an awesome view. And you kind of see as the hill goes down, um, on the other side of the wash there, it turns dark. And this is where all the quartz stringers are. Silver, lead, zinc. Um, very rare, there'll be pockets of gold. And then you get the other side and now you're just a big giant mountain of quartz monzonite again. So you have the intrusive over there that's yeah. the, the mountain. Mm -hmm. And then you have the darker stuff, which is probably gabbro, I'm assuming. Looks like the stuff we've yeah. been driving on. So mm -hmm. you get the stringers through that. Yep. And then you come across the valley. And then you have the gabbro, some gabbro here. And then uh, some more quartz uh, pegmatite. Yep. And that's what holds the uranium. That's right. Okay, we got it all figured out. Okay. Send Dale home. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what are we looking at here? All right, so this is uh, the host rock that's going to carry all the uh, uranium. I think it's otnite, but I don't know. It's, oh, I've never heard of otnite. I don't know. It, Sounds it's good. One of the uranium-type minerals. But, okay. Um, you can see it on the rock. Back in the day, they were blasting this, trying to get access to what wasn't oxidized out from the weathering. And anything anything stained with yellow in, in, the, in the fissures, cracks of the rock is all your uranium so all this all this stuff here is all yellow uranium that's right and then here we have a uh, one of the old drill holes one of the old drill holes that's right and this is this is the quartz pegmatite this stuff here oh yeah, yeah they, they were drilling yeah, all yeah. over on this these thing. holes only go about 30 feet there were two different drilling companies that came out here um the first one drilled these these shallow holes in the mountain and then a second company came out and drilled I think uh, 13 to 20 holes, I can't remember. Oh, wow. But the deepest was like a thousand feet. So you'll come back and drill a hole right next to those two and yeah. <laughs> we'll just keep drilling it. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're just getting her, getting her sorted, dude. Yeah. Ryan. Ryan, I'm Jason. Pleasure. How yeah, you good to meet you. You got uh, Tamarack Geological Services out here. Yeah, we're out here doing a full workup. Uh, starting in on the mapping today. Nice. Just getting on the ground and getting familiar with the rocks and and just try to get the lines drawn next couple of days. Awesome. Yeah. I'm I'm following you guys. I'm we're going to learn how to be a geologist today. What we're doing right now is we're just walking this ridge to just get get an eye on the on the rock types and kind of you know get familiar. And then we're going to head over to the northern claim boundary um and just map our way back to the south. Harry and I were talking about it on the way up. Looks like your your monzonite and pegmatites are a little bit more weather resistant, so they stand up. Yeah. The mafic yeah. stuff. Gabbro? Yeah. Corn blend diorite gabbro yeah, is what, yeah. what they call it. Okay. But yeah. we'll, we'll roll with that for now. Yeah. And, and so for all of us uninitiated YouTubers out here, tell me the difference between gabbro and basalt. Well, the biggest difference is gabbro is intrusive, basalt's extrusive, so mo more volcanic versus you know, plutonic. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So this, so all this gabbro we're standing on, cooled underground, yeah. had some time to grow some crystals, get big, do its thing. In theory, yeah. And then the same with the monzonite. Yep. Yeah. So yep. this is this is all like all, everything we're standing on was cooled underground. There were there weren't any. There's no like volcanic like lavas flow, here. Like lava flows here. Yeah. It's all. It's, it's all been eroded away, and we're standing mm -hmm. on kind of the 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 root of the mountain, if you will. Yeah, Essentially, yeah, getting left. exhumed. Cool. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. We got our mafic intrusive that was here originally, yep. and then was intruded in by these more felsic. Quartz, monzonite, more more granite type yeah, rocks. Yeah. A bunch yeah. of different flavors of that. Yeah. yeah, we're really focused on like what this what this uh, felsic intrusive kind of looks like, how fingered in it is with the with the mafic rocks, what the structure looks like, because all of that's going to have an impact on how the uranium concentrates. Dale and I we had geology courses together years and years ago, but I've never mapped like a mine site, you're, you're looking for economic yeah. reserves. Yeah. So you're identifying the rock types, which is cool. You know, okay, we got rock types, but you're like, where's uranium? That's your, yeah, that's, that's goal. your goal today. Yeah, definitely. And like, why is it there? Yeah. And where is it going? Okay. Awesome. Yep. And so we've got a couple of working hypotheses that we're going to test over the next couple of days. Um, you know, and just gather up all the data we need in order to come up, hopefully come up with a good conclusion. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So it should be 
Should be good, man. Just like old times. Yeah, man. We're excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nice to be down in the sun and where you can see the rocks. Here's a little closer look at that gabbro we've been talking about. Coarser grained, intrusive, and it's the darker stuff we're seeing on the ground. Here's one with a little bit bigger grains. But all this dark colored stuff is what we're calling this mafic intrusive. And then over here, standing up a little bit more weather resistant, is our pegmatite. And pegmatite is like a big vein, essentially. Just like you have with the quartz veins for a mine, but this is more like a big dike. So it came in, there was a fault, it intruded into the fault or the crack or the weak spot. And that's why you have these much more felsic, they're, they're white, you can see they're all white, a lot coarser grains, big grains of quartz. And they're right next to these more mafic, which is essentially a fancy way of saying less quartz, less silica. There's the gabbro, there's the pegmatite, and here's the contact right here, looks like. Where you have the gabbro and the pegmatite touching right there on the boundary. And down here like this. Nice little contact zone there. And so, the pegmatite intruded into the gabbro and apparently brought up a bunch of uranium with it. Here's a little piece of float from the pegmatite, but you can see the big, big crystals in here. Quartz, feldspars, probably some plage, plagioclase as well. But this is what the uranium is hosted in. So we're not really so concerned about the mafic, we're concerned with the pegmatites and the quartz monzonite. Uh, just scanning the, the top of the rock and so the potassium's high and then we start getting into uh, some rare earths, a little bit of cerium is in there. And the way my understanding of this XRF, it shoots x-rays at the rock That's right. and each element has a unique fingerprint that it like right. shoots back off when the the x-ray excites the outermost electron to a higher energy state and then when it falls back down to the lower energy state it releases a photon and that thing reads those yep. and it can tell you what based on the number of photons it's reading yeah so you can you can see see if i can get this show up this is the spectrum so all the different spectrum in here um each one's its own signature element and so through programming, the XRF is able to determine what the elements are based upon the, the spectrum it's getting. So uh, this thing has three different beams, um, and I'm running through three different beams to try to get you know as many of the elements as I can. Um, the setting I'm in right now is just primarily geochem, so for, for rocks and, and soil, and just trying to determine you know what what I'm looking at. But this is this is a rough shot. So I'm starting to pick up like latvium, some rare earths, a little bit of thorium, but um, I'd have to get over to some of the spots that have been opened up yeah. to see the uranium. And exposed, and, and probably, I mean, it's great to come out and shoot rock surfaces like we're doing. Yeah. Better to break them and get a fresh yeah. face, but even better, like you say, to get something that's unoxidized. That's why they're drilling and blasting here on the surface, trying to open it up. But you can take this out in the field like we're doing, and we could do hundreds of scans today if we oh, yeah. wanted, and that would... It, Essentially, it takes place of the assay almost. Not not exactly, yeah. but but you can get a much much better idea of what rocks are carrying, what minerals, and what elements. Yeah. Right away. I mean, within thirty seconds to a minute. Yeah. Whereas twenty years ago, you had to go and bag up a sample of rock, send it off, yeah. and a month later, you'd have some results every and time, a bunch of money. Every time I pull the trigger, it's like forty to sixty dollars in assay. Yeah, absolutely. Right so I can go around and get an idea of what I want to send in for an assay and save myself a bunch of money. So I know these things are expensive, but if you're doing thousands and thousands of assays, if not tens of thousands, 
um, that adds up. It pay, it pay themselves off. This thing off. will pay for itself within a week or two. Well, and, and also, you're out here, you have a limited amount of time, let's say you have three days out here, yeah. and with with collecting samples and sending them off for assay, you're shooting in the dark. Yeah. You don't know. Yeah. Whereas with that thing, you can really focus in over the first day on where you want to, where the hot spots are, and then you're like, okay, this is where this is where I need to focus on. We're on day two of our little mapping project here. And Dale's got it pretty well nailed down here. Wanted to talk you through some of the stuff we've been seeing, but it looks like kind of overall big picture stuff is you had this large, nisic, what are we calling it? Oh, uh, we got like a quartz diorite nice. Quartz diorite nice. nice. And that was kind of your your original rock basement. type. Yep, yeah, that was your basement. That's what's been hanging out here. It was intruded by this gabbro, this more mafic gabbro. And then after that, these pegmatite dikes came through and that's what's holding the uranium and some of the goodies these guys are looking for. Yeah, so we're out here dialing in this contact with our pegmatites, which are the ones that carry most of the uranium on this project. And what we found as we've been moving south is we found that we have a good bit of pegmatite kind of up on that hill over there. And then it grades into where we have a contact with some Nysic rocks. And then we're back into our diorites, our hard blend, our hard blend diorites. And then right here, we have a nice contact with the pegmatite again. And this is just about the southern extent of the peg that we're going to be mapping on this project here. So uh, what I did earlier is I came through here and measured the strike and dip of this contact because the reason we want to know that is because if we ever come here and drill this, we want to know which direction the peg's going. So, you know, if it's dip into the west we want to put the drill over there and drill back down into it so that way we can get as good of an estimate as possible of how thick these pegmatites are um, so that's one of the things that we do is measure the strikes and dips you all saw me do it earlier uh, with jason and those crazy nice banding um, you know so what we do is we do right hand rule all the time you know in this case you know we know this thing's kind of dipping this way and so we're gonna you know point our thumb off to the left and get a strike on this bad boy and it's striking pretty much due north and then we're gonna roll it over and get the dip and gently kind of come through there up up <laughs> oh, that happens plus or minus a couple degrees is cool plus or minus like that and we're around 40 degrees to the west. Okay. Okay. So I already plotted this on the map um, earlier. But so far, here's what's taking shape. So we're down in this area right now. And this is where we're standing. This is our, this is our uh, hornblende diorite on this side. And then here's this red is all of our pegmatites. And it's actually like really fingered in here uh, with a couple of narrow dikes. So this contact here, I drew the strike and dip. But essentially what you do is we have a UTM grid on here. We're calling it pretty much north. So orient this thing north, south. And that's when you draw your strike line, which I have on here. And then you draw the dip angle, a little tick headed to the way that it's dipping with the number nice. on there. And one of the other things that's handy when you're mapping so you don't trash your, your base map is we map on vellum. So that way we can see our underlying aerial and topography and all the roads and all that kind of stuff. You can see the outcrops pretty well. And then you can, you can draw your lines on the vellum. And then when my partner Ryan and I get back together tonight, uh, we can combine both of our vellum sheets and he's been mapping over in this area and so we can complete you know kind of a first draft of this map uh, and, and make a new a new vellum for us to use in the field to spot mm -hmm. check it tomorrow and that'll inform where we want to sample and all that kind of stuff so that's part part of the process and then this one up here is our pegmatite yep and this what tell us a little bit about pegmatites large crystals Yep, large crystal, slow cooling, uh, really pretty, this this one is very felsic, um, so we have like mostly quartz and feldspars in here, um, plagioclase, 
and this is uh, you know where the uranium is so that this is a pretty important unit for us and so we've been really trying to in as much detail as possible map this throughout the, the site mm -hmm. yeah so so you can see the big difference right it's pretty easy to spot Diorite, black and white versus yeah it's pretty black and white yeah so you can see the contact goes up off to the west up there we still got it and so that's part of this mapping is just essentially tracing this up and drawing these lines on the map check this out Ooh, ooh, that'll blow your mind huh <laughs> <laughs> look at this stuff yeah so this is pretty typical of uh like really highly deformed rocks and so what happens is the the different minerals the minerals of different compositions kind of segregate into this nice banding you know and then they're um somewhat plastic so they kind of deform um you know like play wood instead of like a you would think a rock would right and so they kind of they tend to flow more so than break it's one of my favorite geologic words remember what it is what boudinage, boudinage. a little boudinage going on there yeah a little boudinage happening there and this all happened when these rocks were buried super deep you know miles down it's super hot they're plastic mm -hmm. they're getting stretched and squirmed and squished and yep it's going crazy and then once they start getting exhumed and brought up to the surface they harden and turn into hard rocks turn into hard rocks they're but pretty hard right now they're pretty hard yeah but it'll tell you a lot about what was happening deep underground when they were forming yeah so what we're looking for is just like the crystal size um what type of silicates we have in there and if there are any mafix around because that's one of the distinctions between um our rock types and also if it's um if it's starting to have a strong foliation and or is like getting kind of a nice texture then that's another one of our units that we're breaking out so this one is pretty textbook peg so we're gonna go ahead and whip it onto the map just to make sure I'm nice and accurate I grab a GPS point create a temporary waypoint I get my UTM northing and easting so we're about in here okay so I'll just make a little dot and then kind of get oriented I'll uh, I'll check the yep so that lines up really well on our aerial with this outcrop here so guy oh yeah yep so I'm gonna go ahead and make sure I agree that the extents are similar in this outcrop we've got a lot of float here so we really just try to circle in the outcrops with solid lines and then we start um, you know making dotted lines as needed to connect them and then eventually the whole thing kind of comes together <laughs> they connect all the lines and <laughs> connect all the lines you got a picture and then you can really start thinking about it we've been mapping these pegmatite dikes we got these little pods and this more mafic stuff and dale and i just had a little conversation about you know they're not like nice linear straight continuous dikes it's more of this kind of like little pods and little you know they go for a while and then they pinch out and then they come up again and we were talking, was there some like huge regional metamorphism where it kind of boudined, boudinaged out these huge dikes? And we don't think that's the case. We were talking about it and we think when this felsic uh, pegmatites intruded, it's a lot more kind of like a like an anthill almost in 3D space. So you get, rather than these long continuous planar features, it's more like these little pods. And, and so anywhere these pegmatites could make it up through the mafic host they just kind of worm their way up through and so you don't have these nice continuous long planar dikes it's much more potty and and uh it's it's just it's harder to map for sure because you find these little tiny pods and it's like man do i put that on the map it's only 10 square meters or whatever and and so it's a lot harder to map that way but we're finding these little pods that we're putting on the map and we're going to try and get the the bigger picture going here it's also really important to note that the map that dale's making is a 2d feature right we're just seeing what's on the surface but the rocks are 3d so they go down at depth and so what you see on the surface is little pods or everything's not really connected or it doesn't look like 
the, the systems connected. As those things go down at depth, they may have you know fingers that we're seeing on the surface, but down at the bottom they all connect, or there's some some sort of larger three-dimensional structure going on here that it's a little bit harder to see when you're just looking at a 2D map that we're making now. A lot of walking. Geos get their steps in, that's for sure. Well, we're wrapping up the day here. Dale's gonna work on his maps. I wanna give a big special thanks to Dale and Tamarack Geological Services. They do some really awesome stuff. And also a big thank you to Mine Operator for letting us come out and film on their uranium project. This is a pretty cool little property. Well, that wraps it up for this video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed a little walkthrough of how to prospect with the XRF in the desert. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next video.